Hello, and thank you for tuning in again today. I want to start this week off by noting what an historic election this was. In January, Westmore will become Maryland's first black governor, and only the third elected nationwide. Lieutenant Governor-elect Narina Miller is also poised to break the glass ceiling as the first Indian American woman to hold that position. Maryland's also set to have its first female comptroller in Brooke Learman. I also want to congratulate Senator Chris Van Hollen and Representative Jamie Raskin for holding on to their seats. And we remain hopeful that they will be joined once again on Capitol Hill by Congressman Trone, who is still locked in a tight race that's too close to call. I also want to give a sincere thank you to the Board of Elections, volunteers who helped pull it together, and the voters for supporting me for a second term. I'm first and foremost an activist, but for many years I've wanted to be in this position to make the decisions that I believe will leave the county and the world a better place. We have a lot of work to do together to make that happen. I'm excited to start this second term with 11 elected leaders, most of which will be female. That's the first time for Montgomery County, and I congratulate the returning and newly elected Montgomery County Council members. Our county is moving farther away from the pandemic conditions which disrupted our lives and schools and the economy. We need to come together on solutions for affordable housing, encouraging job growth, and advancing our education programs at all levels, and to begin moving forward building a rapid transit network to serve our residents. I believe that with the work we've already begun and the enthusiasm of newly elected leaders, we can advance to work that's needed to build a better future for all of us. I'm very excited to share with you something that I've been working on for the last three years. This week, we entered into an agreement with the University of Maryland at College Park and the University of Maryland in Baltimore, along with the University of Maryland Medical System, to launch the Institute for Health Computing in Montgomery County. It will be the centerpiece of development at the North Bethesda Metro Station, what we used to call White Flint. The Metro Station is really a big deal. As Dean Gladwin said from the University of Maryland School of Medicine, I see this becoming the East Coast Silicon Valley of health computing. The center will focus on artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality learning. Another core component of the center will be machine learning, which will allow for real world applications of the voluminous data collected at the University of Maryland Medical School today. They will aid in medical research projects done by the university and can be applied in other ways to help different industries that utilize big data, like hospitality and even retail. This agreement creates the county's first academic research facility in the heart of the region's BioLife Science Corridor. It will also breathe life into a key section of Rockville Pike and will become the epicenter of the entire region's bio and life sciences community. This project will spur development and likely attract other academic, medical, and research-based businesses to be close to this innovative work. We know computer scientists in College Park already work with doctors and researchers in Baltimore, but up until now, there hasn't been one location to expand on some of the ideas and projects they have yet to try. Montgomery County will be the first home to these experiments and eventual breakthroughs that will pave the way for better treatments for our residents and for people around the world. I'm proud that we'll get to have that kind of role in creating a better healthcare system nationwide for future generations. Despite all the reasons to celebrate this week, I have to pause to acknowledge the death of a friend, former state delegate Sheila Hickson. Her death was announced on Monday. She was not just a longtime representative in Annapolis, but she's been an advisor and someone I admire. Her early work with labor groups in Michigan's Iron Range steeled her for the life in politics, fighting for the underrepresented. She had a stellar reputation as a public servant, putting her constituents and community first while representing the interests of all Marylanders as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, making her the highest ranking woman in the House of Delegates for many years. Her kindness, compassion, and ethical standards made her a trusted voice throughout her four decades in office speaking for Montgomery County. She was a leader on many issues that continue to impact the lives of Marylanders today. She helped usher in significant reforms in funding and the delivery of public education and oversaw the modernization of our election laws and equipment. She was a longtime advocate for the LGBTQ plus residents of our state and was the lead sponsor of Maryland's benchmark 2001 anti-discrimination law. 
Montgomery County has lost one of our great leaders. We are a better community because of her decades of public service. And our county and state's growth, diversity, and success is in part a result of her hard work and dedication. You'll never forget this historic and trailblazing figure. This Friday is Veterans Day. In Montgomery County, we honor the service and sacrifice of our nation's armed forces in several different ways. Last year, we added a service-disabled veteran-owned small business certification to our minority female and disabled-owned business program. It works in coordination with the Small Business Administration and the Department of Veterans Affairs. The goal is to give veterans who own a business an advantage in winning government procurement contracts. Last year, more than $200 million, or close to 27% of government spending, went through the program that will now include veterans. Veterans of Montgomery County also have dozens of providers, agencies, and advocacy organizations available to offer many forms of aid, support, or ways to get involved in the community. On behalf of the Montgomery County's Commission on Veteran Affairs, I want to invite you to participate in Operation Greenlight, a nationwide program to light our community green to support veterans and their transition out of service. There are also many community ceremonies on Veterans Day to honor the men and women who've served in Rockville, Gaithersburg, Wheaton, and Bethesda. Each of these programs starts at 11 a.m. Germantown will also hold a concert at 7 p.m. paying tribute to veterans at Northwest High School. And on Sunday afternoon, another ceremony will be led by the American Jewish War Veterans Memorial at the Bender Jewish Community Center in Rockville. Veterans who were born, raised, or have other ties with Montgomery County are being recognized. I hope you get the chance to attend one or more of these ceremonies, find a way to turn your porch light green, and visit our county website to learn more about the veterans who call Montgomery County home at montgomerycounty.gov backslash veterans. Montgomery County has a new public safety tool in the form of a wastewater surveillance system. The project was prompted by the need to monitor community health threats like COVID-19. With the help of researchers from the University of Maryland and College Park, we're now going to be able to monitor five stations that can help health professionals evaluate when the presence of COVID-19 or other diseases is elevated in our public wastewater. This information is crucial to evaluating community threats. It can give us an early warning system as fewer people rely on PCR tests to determine whether or not they have COVID-19, leaving the community health leaders a little bit in the dark. The equipment is also adaptable. When I learned polio had recently been found in New York State, I made sure that we added that to the list of dangers that we are monitoring. This is just another layer of protection our community needs post-pandemic. I look forward to updates on what these tests tell us about our community, and we'll be sharing them with you. This week's hospitals in our area remain busy because of an early swell of respiratory illnesses impacting young children. RSV cases, that's one of the viruses, are the primary driver of the pediatric hospital visits, but COVID-19 also remains a threat in our community. Primarily, we're seeing BA5 and subvariants of the virus dominating our local case count. It remains around 90 cases per 100,000, putting our community at a level of low, which has been so for the last few weeks. Our transmission rates over the last few weeks remain steady. Bivalent boosters remain our best form of protection for the spread of COVID-19 through Montgomery County. Researchers looking at data since the new boosters were introduced say that less than half of a percent of breakthrough cases came from those who recently received the new shot. Unfortunately, the percentage of people getting that shot is not nearly as high as when the boosters were first introduced. We should be at a peak demand for those new booster shots, but weekly volume statistics show us that demand is already falling. We also see an interest in the flu vaccine flatten out at about 25% in Montgomery County and 21% across the state. I encourage you to stay up to date on your flu shot because the flu, RSV, and COVID are all circulating simultaneously. In terms of monkeypox, or MPX, Montgomery County saw two cases last week, the first new cases in three weeks. The state added eight new cases since our last update. It's a reminder to everyone to be on the lookout for symptoms of the disease, like red welts or itchy scabs. 
There are signs that someone around you may be contagious and close contact with them should be avoided. Weather forecasters are predicting rain to end the, this week as the remnants of Hurricane Nicole move up from the south. Flooding is one of the most frequent severe weather events that we deal with in Montgomery County. The damage caused by flash floods can destroy cars, your home, and as we saw just last year, it can be deadly. I urge you to be prepared by signing up for Alert Montgomery so that you can stay up to date with flood warnings on your mobile devices. I'd like to remind you that we recently revamped our county flood website and are asking for the public's feedback about flood prone areas. The information will help us as we collect new monitoring data and develop a new plan to deal with stormwater management. Please stay safe and remember to have an evacuation plan for your home should emergencies arise. That's our wrap up for today and I hope you have a great week and we'll be back again next week.